Hello again. I'm Reverend Mike Ritten with the Bowman Charge of the United Methodist Church, located in Bowman, South Carolina, and I thank you for tuning in to my channel. Uh, I don't know how many of you folks have actually hit the little button down below to say subscribe, or whether you just Google it, or, you know, do a search to follow, or whatever. But anyway, I thank you for tuning in. Um, I've got the gentleman cutting the grass out there, so you may or may not hear him. Uh, I started this, but fumbled a bit, and he was right up here by the window, so I just decided to go ahead and, and start over. So, uh, again, I thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to be concluding Chapter 2 of the Book of Revelation today. Uh, I God placed this on my heart to do the Book of Revelation this year. And the only time that I plan to not preach on the book of Revelation will be during Palms, <coughs> excuse me, Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, Mother's Day, Father's Day. And I'm hoping to be through the entire book before we hit uh, Advent. So again, even though this is the first Sunday in Lent, I'm going to continue with the uh, book of Revelation. So let us open with a word of prayer. Almighty God, you who call us to prayer and who offers yourself to all who seek your face, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us today and deliver us from coldness of heart, a wandering mind, and wrongful desires. By the power of your Spirit, place within us steadfast love and devotion so that today we may worship and serve you with all of our life. We ask these things and pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so, chapter 2, verses 18 through 29 is the scripture reading. Again, the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Hear now the inspired, inerrant word of God. And again, Jesus speaks throughout this uh, book because he is speaking to an angel who speaks to, we believe, the Apostle John, who's on the Isle of Patmos. So, again, hear now the inspired, inerrant word of God. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest of I Tyria, I think that's the way it's pronounced, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have, have till I come, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule over them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. 
as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has says to the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Again, that was from the book of Revelation, second chapter, verses 18 through 29. So, this will be the end of chapter 2. It's getting interesting. I'm enjoying this. Uh, unfortunately, we never covered it in my seminary class, but uh, I think I've explained that in uh, the other videos on this series. So, anyway. Lord, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to you this morning and be of inspiration to those who have gathered here for the reading and hearing of your most holy word. I ask these things and pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And again, you have to bear with me because I've got the manuscript up there on the big screen. And I'm recording here on my laptop, so you're going to see me do this quite a bit. Anyway, Jesus begins this letter to the church at Thyatira in verse 18 with a description of himself. To the angel of the church of Thyatira, write these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Here Jesus is emphasizing that he is the Son of God, the second person in the Trinity. And he has a message of purifying power and judgment to give to this secretly sinning church. The secret sinners, the ones who are learning Satan's so-called deep secrets, were probably thinking, no one sees me. No one knows what I'm doing. But Jesus said, he has eyes of blazing fire and sees everything. Jesus describes his feet as glowing like fine polished brass. At first, Jesus speaks words of praise to this church. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. That's a very impressive list. He commends their hard work. Their deeds flowing from love and faith. Unlike the church at Ephesus, it seems that this church hasn't forsaken their first love. Jesus commends their love for him and their love for one another. He speaks to the believers, the ones who are living out their belief. By their faith, they see Jesus as Savior. They see the future, and they have knowledge of the coming judgment. They have a genuine faith. They're not dead in their transgressions and sins. Jesus commends their service and their perseverance. They're working hard, serving one another with the hearts of a servant. We don't know exactly what their persecutions that they had to endure, but we can assume from the other letters that we've covered so far that the persecutions were probably very similar, yet they were persevering. Jesus commends their growth and development. They're doing more than they did at first. Living things grow. And these believers were growing. This church was growing. It's hard to imagine now that a church that receives such praise from Jesus could have a fatal flaw, fatal flaw, say that ten times fast, at its heart. On the surface, everything looks good. That's what makes all of this so scary. It's vital for us in the 21st century to hear this message and to look beyond the surface. 
A tolerance of sexual sin and the secret pattern of illicit sexual activities effectively nullifies all of those good works. That's the problem. The issue of tolerance of sin just as it is in our present day society, and more importantly, even within our churches today. In verse 20, Jesus says, I have these things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. There's a deadly danger from within. There's an outward worldly influence, certainly. But Christ is speaking of a heart wound, a cancer from within. And the ch church was literally tolerating it. The letter is addressed to Christians, so it could be that there were indeed individuals who were tolerating the sin that was within themselves, thinking it was okay. But of course, it wasn't. Beyond that, even those who weren't directly involved were tolerating those who were. They weren't performing church discipline. This is hard for many in the 21st century to hear. We love and celebrate tolerance. The threat in the church was sexual immorality, secret and hidden, and being taught by a woman prophetess. She was luring and enticing some of the church members into immorality. They were being led astray by her. The sexual immorality was undoubtedly linked to the old pattern of pagan religion. It was something that the folks at that time would have been familiar with, part of the way that the pagan worship was conducted back then. However, this woman had added a twist to it. Many scholars believe that she was teaching a mixture of Christian doctrine, which states that the grace of God covers all sin, and Greek dualism, which believes that the body and the soul are separate and unrelated, and that it didn't matter what one did with the body. She was turning the grace of God into a license for immorality. Who is that woman Jezebel? The text implies that she was a real woman, though the name Jezebel was purely symbolic. She calls herself a prophetess. She wasn't a true prophet called by God. She took that honor and office on herself. In those days, there were godly prophets and prophetesses. This woman was not a godly prophet. Why does Jesus call her Jezebel? The name refers to a well-known account in the Old Testament. In the days of God's prophet Elijah, King Ahab of Israel married a wicked, wicked woman named Jezebel, the daughter of a pagan king. King Ahab was a weak-willed and ultimately wicked man. Jezebel specifically and purposely led Israel into a pattern of false religion to worship Baal. That worship, which was similar to this church in Tyria, involved sexual immorality and worshiping false gods and goddesses. Jesus used that title to talk about this woman in the church at Thyatira. She was leading them in secret rituals. 
We don't know the exact nature of those activities, but we know they weren't done openly. Look at verse 24. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. In secret, they did disgusting things with their bodies. In secret, they ate meals sacrifice, meat sacrificed to detestable idols. In secret, they learned deeper words of knowledge, perhaps early Gnostic practices. The problem was that the church was tolerating it. So Jesus had to bring a threat of impending judgment on them. We must heed warnings in Scripture. It's part of our faith. Part of our faith to be convicted, not, not just with the assurance of things hoped for, but convicted, as in a court of law, in reference to our sins. Faith does that. And so as Christians, we need to heed the warnings in Scripture. Jesus also gave this Jezebel a warning. In verses 21 through 23, he says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is not willing. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. If you're trapped in a pattern of secrets, then those could be some of the scariest words you've ever heard. This is opposite what Jesus is giving you to, or this this is the this is the opportunity. I'm sorry, opportunity that Jesus is giving you to repent. Remember, the wages of sin is death. People think that just because God hasn't acted on His warning, that He doesn't care. Well, maybe He's lowered His standards. That's not true. Just because nothing has happened yet doesn't mean that God has changed his mind. For Jezebel, her time had run out. There was no chance for her now. She was finished. God promised that he would kill her by a severe disease, yet she refused to repent. Jesus said that his judgment will not be limited to her, but also to her children, those who follow her, rather than talking about her biological children. Through this letter, God is giving them a little more time to repent. But if they don't, they will indeed die. Christ calls on the pure in Thyatira to do their duty. Verses 24 and 25 says, Now to you I say and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what I have till I come. To the Christians in that church, Jesus is saying, hold on. Don't get sucked in. Don't be drawn into this wickedness. And above all, don't tolerate it. In verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, of end to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed into pieces like the potter's vessel. 
This seems to indicate that we who overcome will participate in Jesus' second coming. It might relate to rulership in the millennium, but it possibly relates to positions of authority in the new heaven and the new earth, sharing in the authority of Christ. In verse 28 we read, I will give him the morning star. The morning star is named for the planet Venus when it appears in the east just before sunrise. Jesus also has been referred to the morning star. Many scholars believe that what Jesus is saying is, if you will overcome this sin, if you will conquer, I will give you a sense of the coming glory of the full bright day. You will have a sense of how glorious it will be when we are in the new heaven and the new earth. And there won't be any sin at all. I will give you a foretaste of heaven. This letter to the church at Thyatira pleads with the sinners to come to Christ. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for sinners like you and me. Jesus will set us free. He has the power to set sinners free and to forgive all of our sins, past, present, and future. To you Christians who have struggled with secret sin, I'm pleading with you to flee from any and all of your sins. Sin is all around us. We see it on the internet, in magazines, and in ads on the billboards. It's everywhere. There are so many forms of sin. A little white lie is a sin. When the cashier accidentally gives you back too much change and you decide to pocket it anyway, that too is a sin. I'm sure each of you can come up with other examples of sin. Scripture teaches us that God has declared that the penalty for sin is death spiritual death. We know that we're all sinners. We have to do our best to repent of our sins, to earnestly repent, not simply say, I'm sorry. This is why we need to have that personal relationship with Jesus. He paid for our sins, but that doesn't mean that we can continue to sin. When we do earnestly repent, and we do our best to live our lives according to God's holy word, we'll be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who will guide us in our everyday life and remind us of the teachings of both God and Christ. It's not easy being a Christian and living in a world filled with sin and evil. We need to hold fast to our faith and to the teachings of both God and Christ. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. If you've not yet asked Jesus to come into your life and take control, I pray that you will do it today. Remember, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this inspiring message. Yes, Lord, we are all sinners. We stumble and fall from time to time. We can't help it. We're human. You, Lord, were the only perfect person to ever walk the face of this earth. And so we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit when we ask Jesus to come into our lives and take control. For those who have not yet asked Jesus to come into their lives and take control. I, I pray, Lord, that you will send your spirit to work with their spirit, because we know that you desire all of us to have eternal life in your heavenly kingdom. It's important that we get into the word of God every single day, so I hope and pray that 
those who are tuning in to this channel will pick up their Bibles and get a good devotional that they can work on every single day. Again, Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you've already bestowed upon each and every one of us. Again, Lord, watch over us and protect us because we are living in some very rough times. Russia has invaded Ukraine. There's a possibility of a nuclear war if Vladimir Putin continues to think that he needs to have a world empire. We hope and pray that we won't have World War III. But we realize that, Lord, you're in control. And if ever we needed to have Jesus come back, now would be a good time. Anyway, I thank you, Lord, for working with me as I read and write and present the book of Revelation. We ask these things and pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you're enjoying this. Um, many, Too many people think of the book of Revelation as nothing but doom and gloom. But as, as I mentioned way back at the very beginning, the book of Revelation is a revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. And it talks about his second coming. And it helps us to prepare for his second coming. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope you will tune in next week. Um, I fully intend to keep each week to uh, present these. As we go through, uh, it helps me get ready for tomorrow, for Sunday, when I do this before the congregation. So, receive now the benediction. Almighty God, cause your good gifts to flow in and through our lives and our various ministries this day and always. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Again, thank you for tuning in. May God bless you and your family. May God bless the United States of America. Take care, and I hope to see you all back here next week.